Okay. So, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the XR Access Research Seminar. Uh, just letting everyone know that we're recording the seminar. So, yeah. With that on the way, let's let's get started. Just wanted to introduce ourselves quickly. We're saying hello a bunch of times, but who are we? Um, so my name is Mahika. I'm a PhD student at Cornell University, and and I'm Ricardo Gonzalez, another PhD student, but in information science, not computer science. Yeah, and we're both advised under Professor Shuri Azenkot, um, who's the director of the XR Access Initiative and also wonderful, wonderful professor and researcher. Um, <clears throat> so for those of you who don't know, XR Access is just um, a community that shares all things related to accessibility and AR, VR. It involves folks from academia, industry, with a lot of diverse backgrounds and designing, developing, policy making. Um, if you've heard of it, like we host annual XR access symposiums and the photo here with a bunch of people smiling and laughing is from the first XR access symposium that we held pre-COVID. And since then it's been virtual. Um, so it's just a community to like share resources and tools and experiences of all things related to AR, VR and accessibility. Uh, speaking of tools, one of the most recent tools that are being shared is this XR Accessibility GitHub Toolkit that I just wanted to like plug right here. Uh, this is just a project for developers to find code for ensuring accessibility on various platforms. So it has resources like Professor Zhao's Seeing VR Toolkit that we'll hear more about today, but also many other projects and guidelines. So you can access it on xra.org slash github with a capital G, capital H. Um, so yeah, if you're developing any projects um, for your prototypes or anything, feel free to take a look and maybe you might benefit from them. You can also add your own projects to it. Um, I'll pass it on to my colleague, Ricardo, to introduce the speaker and say more about the research side of things. Okay, thank you so much, Mahika, for that important information about the network. So, uh, about XR Access, sorry. So I'm going to briefly introduce what's the research network again. We will do this often in our seminars because we sometimes have new people and we want everyone to be on the same page. So what's the research network in the XR Access community? Basically, we want to celebrate and share academic research with a collective goal of making XR technologies accessible. The main way that we are doing this right now is by conducting monthly seminars, but we also want to share funding opportunities and other collab collaborative opportunities when available. And also things like the tool that Mahika just presented, the, the, the repository where we can find uh, technologies to make XR more accessible. So for today's speaker, um, for today's speaker, we have uh, assistant professor Yuhan Xiao from the Department of Computer Science at the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison. Her research interest includes human computer interaction, accessibility, augmented reality, and virtual reality, and others. She designs and builds intelligent interactive systems to enhance human abilities. Personally, I have known Yuhan since she was a PhD student. I feel like she's one of the most amazing researchers that I have met. So I hope you all can enjoy her work as much as I have enjoyed it reading about it and seeing the incredible things that she has done for XR accessibility. Without further ado, um, we can go and start uh, Johan's presentation. Thank you, Ricardo, for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to just uh, share my slides. Meanwhile, while, while we change uh, screens, you can leave your questions in the chat and we will read through them later in the Q&A. Uh, we will try to respond uh, 
all of them if possible. Okay, so hi everyone, my name is Yu Hang Zhao. Uh, I'm an assistant professor uh, from the University of Wisconsin Madison. So I actually was a, a PhD student, I graduated from Cornell Tech and uh, advised by Shri Anzakot. So it's uh, a pleasure for me to come back and give this talk, be a uh, part of this XR our access uh, organization. Uh, so today uh, I want to talk about uh, some of my uh, work on um, how to make virtual reality accessible for people with visual impairments. Uh, and I'm going to talk about two work. Uh, uh, one is um, how to uh, how we designed a haptic controller to uh, enable people who are blind to navigate a virtual space. And another one is seeing VR, where we design and build a set of tools to uh, make virtual reality more accessible for people with low vision. And actually, both of these work uh, are collaborations with Microsoft Research. I actually see one of my collaborators at Kyoto here. So hi. <laughs> and uh, OK, so about virtual reality. So we all know that this is a very trending topic now and uh, everyone um, is talking about it. Uh, and recently Facebook has changed its name to Meta and have this concept of Metaverse. Uh, that's very exciting. And uh, it can actually virtual reality uh, can be applied to many, many different fields and probably uh, used by a lot of people, right? It can be uh, applied to education, not only entertainment, right? But also re rehabilitation, education, social events, especially during the COVID uh, time. This is a very special time and people also start to see the uh, very big value of this technology. But a big problem with this virtual reality technology is still currently it's very vision dominant and it's not accessible to uh, people with disabilities and specifically uh, for people with vision impairments. Although there has been some uh, early work that people started to look into um, how we can make this technology more accessible, more widely used, uh, including acoustic VR, where people generate different spatial audio to enable blind people to better hear uh, the surrounding environment in a virtual space, uh, and also haptic VR, where people uh, generate, uh, build up uh, robot arms, for example, that simulate a sort of a white can interaction, but they have to uh, really sit ready in front of the table uh, and use the controller to uh, touch and feel different virtual objects in the environment. Uh, but the experience wouldn't be immersive enough because if you think about how people currently use virtual reality, right, uh, you not only see the surrounding environment, hear the spatial audio, you also can freely walk around your physical room, but you feel like you're walking in a very different virtual space. Uh, so how can we uh, improve this technology to make it accessible, but also provide people the very similar uh, immersive experience to enable them to freely explore the virtual space? That would be an uh, important research direction that uh, me and my uh, students are looking at. And today I'm going to talk about the two of my early research. Both of them have been done during my PhD life, actually. Uh, uh, one is controller, the other is seeing VR. And uh, I'm going to use these two as examples to talk about how uh, we design technologies for people who are blind and the people with low vision to uh, bring them equal access to uh, the virtual space. So I'm going to start with controller. Um, and the goal of this research is really to think about how we can uh, enable uh, people, uh, people who are blind, uh, to uh, freely walk around a virtual space and explore the space, uh, understand what are in the environment uh, based on uh, their real life uh, kin techniques because uh, white kin is the most commonly used navigation tools that people, uh, blind people are using in their daily life. And uh, this is the most common way and their preferred way to navigate and explore the world. That's why when we, um, shift from the uh, physical space, the real world to the virtual space, whether we can reuse uh, and leverage this uh, skill that people already have in their daily life and enable them to better explore the virtual space. So that's a goal of this controller research project. 
and we try to design a virtual reality controller that can transform people's cane techniques to the virtual world to enable people to physically navigate and explore a virtual space more comprehensively and effectively. But before uh, we actually start to design and build up our technology, the first thing we did is we try to understand because you know VR is still a very new concept for people with visual impairments. So we first we want to understand people's expectations on virtual reality, as well as uh, how people actually use the white can in the real world, so that we can better build the connection between the real world and the virtual space. So we conducted this formative study uh, with seven uh, can what can users uh, who have visual impairments and also five O&M uh, orientation and mobility instructors. So we conduct an uh, interview with them, right? Talk about their expectations, their uh, whether they have any prior experience with virtual reality and also um, with both the can users and also the O&M instructors. We also talk about um, ask them how do they use the white can in their real world and whether there is a possibility we can transfer this real world skill to the virtual world. Uh, so these are the two uh, general questions we're asking uh, or research questions we're uh, seeking an answer. One is do we uh, visually impaired people need VR, right? And what are their expectations? And the second one would be uh, how do visually impaired people navigate with the white can in their real world and how can we transfer the skill to the virtual world? And based on the study, we actually find that uh, people with visual impairments, they have very high interest in terms of uh, virtual reality. A lot of them uh, mentioned they do want equal access to benefit from this technology, just like sighted people do, uh, which uh, is a very important motivation to our research. And also in terms uh, from the perspective of the O&M instructors, a lot of them mentioned that they expect virtual reality could be used as important mobility training and rehabilitation tools. Because, you know, when they try to train uh, blind people how to use a white can, many times there is a limitation that uh, the funding resource, both from, you know, their organization and also from their clients, is, is very limited. So that they wouldn't really have enough time and enough resources to help them um, complete a full session of training, uh, like uh, many, many uh, sessions of training to enable uh, teach people how to use the white can. But if we have virtual reality, that we can use that to simulate different scenarios. For example, especially those very risky and dangerous scenarios, for example, stairs, right? Uh, crossing a very crowded street. So in these scenarios, if we can use virtual reality to simulate that, and then maybe we can save a lot of money and um, effort and still enable people with visual impairments to get a fair amount of training. So that's uh, a quote from one of our O&M uh, participants, uh, uh, O&M instructor participants saying, the funding doesn't, does not always allow ideal training amounts. And this could potentially um, be a problem that virtual reality can address if this uh, technology is accessible to people with visual impairments. And at the same time, we also uh, talk to people about how uh, what would be uh, the most suitable techniques uh, to use a white cane. And first of all, we find that people use both uh, tactile and audio feedback when they try to use a white cane to explore the explore the real world. Uh, for example, they uh, hear the audio feedback when they can knock onto different environment or sweep on different textures, right, on a concrete floor or on a carpet and so on. Uh, and also, there are three very typical uh, cane techniques that people would use. First of all is the two-point touch, where you use a cane to tap on both sides uh, of your body uh, in a specific order, uh, left and right and left, so that you can clear out the different op uh, the potential obstacles in front of you. And the second one is constant contact where people can use the white cane to sweep uh, in front of them uh, between left and right, so uh, which is a more thorough exploration of the uh, environment right in front of them. 
And the last one is shorelining, which is used uh, when people want to walk along a specific vertical surfaces. For example, they want to walk along a curb, a, a street curb, or if they want to walk along a wall, a hallway, and that would be the technique they use where they use uh, the cane to tap uh, always towards a specific side uh, of the, uh, their body uh, where there is such a vertical um, surface and they kept tapping it so make sure they can walk along this uh, vertical surface. So these are the three most typical uh, white cane techniques that people would use. And based on these findings, uh, we try to distill our design implications, which is first, we want to support multi-module feedback when we try to design uh, a technology, specifically a controller, to enable people, blind people, to explore a virtual space. So we want to provide both audio and haptic feedback for people to better understand the virtual world, just like how they explore the real uh, environment. And the second one is we want to simulate the standard uh, cane techniques so that people can directly transfer their real world cane, st cane skills into the virtual world so that their uh, cognitive load and learning curve would be much lower uh, in, uh, as opposed to learning a totally new technology and interaction techniques. So these are the two um, design implications that we got and our design exactly follow these two guidelines. And based on that, we designed cane controller. This is a research published uh, at uh, uh, CHI 2019. Uh, so cane controller is a variable uh, virtual reality controller uh, where people, uh, we have uh, part of it is a vest that you can wear ready in front of your chest. And then there is a brick mechanism uh, that people can wear. And we also have this cane controller, which is uh, uh, simulate, you know, it's actually part of the white cane, but we cut it short so that it wouldn't really uh, touch any um, real object in the physical environment. So this uh, piece is uh, the, the controller that people will usually hold. Uh, and we connect this controller uh, with a slider uh, to the break mechanism. And I'm going to talk more uh, about this later to uh, explain how this works to generate the physical resistance when uh, the controller uh, hit on a virtual object in the virtual environment. And then we also have a, vo a voice coil to generate vibration and also a tracker, where is, uh, which is a HTC Vive tracker so that we can easily track the user's position in the space. And to use this, uh, the system, the user uh, will need to wear our controller and also wear a head mounted display, even though we wouldn't really show anything in front of them, but we are using the uh, spatial audio system from the headset. That's why uh, we still uh, have the user to wear the head mounted display uh, when trying to use our system. So this is the general setup of our device. And you may notice that our controller is much shorter uh, than the real white can. Uh, this is because uh, we try to use this to enable people to explore, explore the virtual space. Uh, that's why we don't want the can to be too long so that it can accidentally hate any real objects in the physical world, which can confuse people a lot. So that we use a short, uh, uh, a part, part of the white can as a controller, which is very short, but the, what it represents is a virtual can that is uh, usually in the same length with the, uh, the white can uh, in the real world. So what you can see here is a virtual overlay on top of the, the controller from the virtual world. So the shorter uh, version of the uh, haptic controller is actually representing a much longer uh, uh, white can in the virtual space. And then with this, we provide multi-module feedback, including the physical resistance, uh, where if the controller hits uh, in the virtual world, if the virtual can hits a virtual object and the user will feel the physical resistance. And also we generate uh, vibrotactile feedback to simulate uh, the vibration people will feel when the can uh, interact with the different environment and also the spatial audio feedback to simulate the sound uh, when the can interact with the environment. And I'm going to show videos to demonstrate how they work. 
So this is a video uh, that uh, is a sort of a mixed reality video where we uh, overlay the virtual environment on top of the physical world so that you can see uh, both the user's uh, behavior and what's happening in the virtual space. And this is demonstrating how people feel the physical resistance and how it works is, uh, so this is this uh, brick mechanism, it uh, uh, by default allows 360 degree of uh, movement. Uh, and if the user sweep uh, the controller in their hand, right, and then um, it will um, move the slider at the same time, and the slider can rotate around this break mechanism. So that's how people can move their uh, this controller. But if the virtual can hits a virtual object in uh, in the uh, VR environment. And then this uh, brick will lock, will be locked, will shut off, and then it will stop the movement of the slider so that uh, this physical resistance will be passed to uh, the user's controller, the controller in the user's hand, and then they will feel this uh, force uh, feedback from the brick, and they cannot move their controller anymore, which simulates the experience when your uh, real can hits a real object and then you. Uh, get this force feedback, which stop you from moving. So that's a mechanism of this uh, break, uh, how we can use this to general, uh, generate physical resistance with this controller uh, setup. And at the same time, uh, we also use this voice coil to generate a uh, vibral tactile feedback to simulate the vibration uh, when the candy hits the different objects or sweep on different uh, texture of a surface. For example, a carpet uh, or uh, a more a smooth floor. So we can simulate all these different vibrations via the uh, voice coil. And the last thing we generate is uh, auditory feedback. So we recorded the, the actual sound when the white can hit the different uh, real world objects, and then we play it back so that people will have the similar experience, uh, hear the similar sound feedback uh, when the white can interact with the real world. So this is the audio you hear when it hits the uh, plastic trash can. and a sound for the carpet. Uh, so that's the three different type of feedback we have. And also uh, combining these different feedback, we can support the three standard CAN interaction techniques, including shorelining, constant contact, and two-point touch. So here is shorelining where the user try to use our device to walk along a virtual, a virtual wall. And also constant contact to uh, feel uh, sweep in front of them to sense the texture uh, of the floor. Or this is a tactile dome, which means it's tactile paving uh, with uh, these uh, dot texture. Uh, and they usually appear at the uh, curb cut to tell people where to cross the street. So by generating these different texture, we can enable people to use what surface they are walking on. And the last one is two point touch and people can just tap on both sides of their body. But you may notice that, uh, but you may notice that uh, when people do uh, two point touch, uh, the virtual can actually sometimes can penetrate into the floor too much. And this is because, you know, in this version of the controller, we don't really support the vertical direction of force feedback. And that's why we cannot uh, control how much people get, uh, get deep into uh, the vertical direction. That's why we also generate this warning sound to let people know if their virtual can get too much deep into the surface. Oops. Sorry, my slides got crazy a little bit. And now I want to show a video uh, demonstrating how uh, a person with uh, visual impairments can use controller to explore a virtual environment. I found 
the trash can and tapping. I found a table. So to evaluate our technology, we uh, actually build up two different virtual environments, including an indoor environment and also outdoor environment to see uh, how effective a uh, con controller is when uh, a, people, a person with visual impairments use it to explore different virtual reality scenes. Uh, and also we try also try to collect the qualitative uh, data to understand their experience, uh, including how immersive uh, their experience is and how much it can enable people to build a, a better uh, mental model of, of the specific environment. So how we do that is uh, we recruited nine uh, people participants with visual impairments, uh, five female, four male participants, uh, and all of them were legally blind and all of them were cane users. And during the study, we first set up a, a tutorial session to uh, instructed them how to use our device. And we build up a very simple scene with some specific uh, virtual object, for example, a chair, and ask them to walk around it and experience uh, how it works. And the participant will try to use, uh, will uh, keep the, uh, exploring our uh, device until they feel comfortable. They are uh, confident that they understand how the system works. And then we move to the virtual reality exploration phase, uh, where we build up uh, two things, an indoor environment and an outdoor environment, uh, and give them some specific tasks to, to explore the environment. And we also conducted a follow-up interview to ask about their experience. So uh, here are the two uh, virtual scenes that we present to the user. Uh, the one on the left is an indoor environment, where we have a um, a small room with carpet uh, on the floor. Uh, it has a, trash, a plastic trash can, a wooden door, and also a plastic, uh, a metal uh, desk, uh, metal table there. And uh, what we ask the participant to do is they will first freely explore the room and think a lot at the same time to talk about their experience and what they find. And by the end, we ask them to stand in the center of the room and tell us how many objects we find and point to us the general direction of the different virtual objects. And the second task is in this outdoor scene where uh, we simulate a, a street uh, with traffic and we also generate spatial audio to uh, inform people the direction of the traffic. And then uh, this environment has the the street curb, uh, the curbside, uh, and also a uh, uh, metal traffic light pole, and also some tactile domes to indicate where the user should cross the street. And we always ask the participant to start at this specific start point and ask them to distinguish the traffic direction, explore the environment, and try to cross the street uh, to the right end, uh, cross the street from the left side to the right side. So that's a task that they, uh, they would need to complete in our study. And based on this exploration, we also, uh, for each of the scenario, we also ask about people's uh, immersive experience by using this presence questionnaire. Uh, and there are eight questions we used, and each of them have a score ranges from one to seven. So this questionnaire was uh, designed for sighted people originally. That's why we actually uh, modified some of the questions to uh, make sure they are not visual focused. Uh, so for example, we asked, is the VR word uh, I had, uh, in the uh, VR world, I had a sense of being there. So that's one of the questions. And we asked them to give score from one to seven to indicate their agreement with this statement. And there are eight questions in total, and we uh, calculate the, the mean score uh, to uh, get an idea of people's uh, immersion uh, in the different environment. So based on the study, we find that uh, controller uh, was very effective to most of the participants. And in the indoor scene, eight out of nine participants can correctly uh, locate uh, all the different virtual objects and uh, point to the right direction. 
And for the outdoor thing, it was a bit more challenging. And six out of nine participants can successfully uh, cross the virtual street with very minimum assistance from the research research team. Uh, but we also find uh, three participants had a bit of difficulty, but the uh, major difficulty would be distinguish the traffic sound. Uh, for some of them, uh, it's difficult for them to understand uh, the direction of the traffic, so that is a bit difficult for them to understand uh, towards uh, towards which direction they should cross the street uh, because of the, the confusion of the 3D audio. Uh, and in terms of the sense of presence, uh, people in generally uh, in general give very high scores. Uh, and the mean score for uh, the indoor scene uh, was 5.3, uh, and five is the highest score. Uh, seven was the highest score. And the mean score to the outdoor scene is 5.1. Uh, so we try to uh, compare, uh, you know, people's presence uh, between the different scenes to see which type of environment would be more suitable uh, to simulate, you know, a more immersive experience and for people to explore with our controller. But we really didn't find any significance between these two types of scenes. Uh, and by the end, we also asked people, observed people's ex uh, behaviors when they try to use the controller and also uh, understand their experiences during this whole process. And we find that all participants were able to uh, directly adapt their real world cane techniques to the virtual world when they use our cane controller. Uh, and also with cane controller, they can uh, perceive, mostly perceive the size and the shape of different virtual apps objects by, you know, walk around this object and knock, uh, knock the object uh, with their uh, controller. And uh, one interesting thing is we also find people can, uh, even though some objects is big, uh, but they can also by, you know, exploring the different pieces, uh, pieces of this object and build up a pretty good mental model of what this object is. So for example, one of the participants mentioned, it's a big desk because I found two legs and then a while later, I find that the third lab. So even though they uh, reveal the different labs at different time, but they can build the association between the different pieces of that metal desk. And by the end, we also ask uh, people like what uh, modality, feedback modality would be the most beneficial. And the people's the feedback is sort of mixed. Uh, two of them think the physical resistance is the most helpful, and three think the audio feedback is the most helpful. And the four of them uh, would really prefer the combination of the feedback. And we also find that uh, people feel the physical resistance is better for them to distinguish, you know, the small details, for example, the boundaries between uh, different virtual objects. But the audio feedback um, is more of uh, convey the general experience, the immersion uh, in the virtual environment. So as one of the participants mentioned, the physical resistance was the way to create the boundaries between various virtual objects. When perceiving minor details, the sound cannot convey that, uh, but the force uh, make it more realistic. So in general, uh, people feel that the physical feedback versus the audio feedback, they actually uh, are uh, helpful in different perspectives when they try to uh, convey people uh, the, ex, uh, the information from the physical, uh, from the virtual world. So that's uh, the research about cane controller where we try to design and build a haptic uh, controller to enable uh, people with visual impairments to uh, freely walk around and navigate a virtual space. Uh, but this work, mostly we focus on people who have uh, very limited vision. We didn't really consider visual feedback at all, which means we didn't consider another very important group of people with visual impairments uh, who have low vision, but still sort of prefer using their uh, functional vision in uh, many daily activities. And they actually are the majority of people with visual impairments, uh, which uh, take up about 90% of people with visual impairments. So that's why the next project that I want to talk about is how we can design uh, accessibility tools to make virtual reality more accessible for people with low vision. And why virtual reality is also 
challenging for people with low vision. So as I mentioned, they still have functional vision to use and uh, um, they prefer to use their vision, but still uh, their visual ability can be uh, limited because of their visual impairments. And in virtual reality, uh, a lot of tasks could be very difficult. For example, this is a sort of a random uh, application I downloaded uh, uh, from GitHub, uh, which is a room escape application. And you can see this is a very dark uh, room, right? And all the text on the wall is very low contrast. And there are many, many different tasks uh, a user need to conduct in this environment. Uh, they need to explore this very dark environment, right? And read the text of the instruction on the wall and find all the different low contrast objects and pick them up and flip things around to find the clues and then get out of this room. And in terms of low vision people's uh, visual condition, there is also very complex. Uh, there, it could include many different conditions. For example, people's vision can be very blurry or they lose their central vision, have blind spots or lose their peripheral vision. And a lot of them, their visual conditions can be a mix of these uh, different situations, which make, uh, make it very difficult for them to uh, perceive all the complex the virtual environment um, when they try to use virtual reality. And to address this problem, we designed Seeing VR, uh, which include 14 different low vision tools uh, that can augment the virtual uh, scene or virtual scene in different ways. So you can see each of the tool as a specific augmentation method that that is applied to a virtual reality scene. And most of them are adapted from the real world low vision technologies. And some of my prior work that I design and build on augmented reality glasses to enable low vision people to complete a different a real world tasks. For example, a visual search task, a reading task. And we try to adapt uh, still, you know, the concept is we want to reduce people's learning curve and the cogn cognitive load. That's why we want to adapt to something that people are familiar in their real world to the virtual space. That's why we construct, uh, build up all these different tools and uh, uh, try to show them to people with low vision and see whether this can help them better perceive a virtual reality environment. So some of the tools are designed based on uh, people's low vision conditions. So I'm only going to give one or two examples for each type of tools. And one example is this peripheral remapping tool, uh, which uh, focused on people who have uh, peripheral vision loss. So they, uh, people also say they have tunnel vision because they could only see very limited uh, field of view within their central vision. Uh, and how we address this is we designed a tool called a peripheral remapping, where we generate a contour version and also a minimized version of the wider environment, uh, but re-render them in the user's central vision so that they can still have a glance of the bigger environment. And we overlay this uh, on their original vision so that they uh, they could both see the uh, have their original view to see uh, what's in ready in front of them, but also see this overlay to have a better understanding of the surrounding environment. And we also enable people to uh, adjust the position of this overlay to the most preferred position in their field of view, and also adjust the color to get uh, the best contrast from the environment. And some of the tools were designed more specifically based on the different virtual reality tasks. So for example, uh, reach out an uh, object and pick it up could be very difficult. It's a very representative task in virtual reality that you use a controller to uh, pick up things. But it could be very difficult for people with low vision because a lot of them, they uh, lose their depth perception. That's why when they try to use the controller to touch the object, they don't know when to stop. Um, that's why uh, to enhance their depth perception, we designed this depth measurement tool where we attach the, this laser to people's controller, a very bright and visual laser. And then when this laser collides uh, collide with the different objects, uh, we render this ball uh, at, the, uh, at the intersection point so that the user can observe the distance between the ball and the controller to see how far away they are uh, towards the specific virtual object so that they can have a better idea of how they can pick things up with the controller. 
So uh, these are some example, uh, examples of the tools we support. And to enable people to widely use this technology, uh, and so we design, uh, we build a post hoc uh, plugin that incorporate most of these tools um, so that uh, people can apply these tools directly to uh, any existing Unity-based VR applications and uh, modify and augment these virtual scenes directly. Because you know, most of these um, uh, augmentation tools are actually uh, can be applied to the different scenes without any semantic information uh, provided from the scene. Uh, that's why we can incorporate them all into this post hoc plugin so that we don't need any um, specific effort from the developers. So this is a video showing how uh, the different tools can be applied uh, to different uh, very popular virtual reality applications. So this is a uh, magnification glass uh, attached to a scene, uh, which is uh, Again, uh, Walls of the Wizard, and this is Edge Enhancement. Solo. This is a text-to-speech. Party. And that's a profile remapping. And Edge Enhancement with the depth measurement tool. And it turned out this, uh, even though we designed this uh, depth measurement tool uh, for people to understand the distance, but people by the end use this a lot in the target shooting task because it can better help people to see where the laser is pointing at. So, well, most of the tools, as I mentioned, don't the, didn't really require any semantic understanding of the scene and we can apply them directly to any virtual reality applications. But it will be great uh, if we can get some semantic information so that we can uh, augment the different virtual elements uh, uh, applications more sophisticatedly. Uh, that's why if the, we can, you know, the developers are the one who actually build up this application and they know a lot more than us uh, in terms of that specific application. So we started to think about what if the developers can provide us some meta information about the virtual application and we can, so that uh, we can further leverage this information to create new tools to uh, augment the different virtual environment. So for example, if the developers can label different virtual objects in the environment, and then we can maybe have an object description tool where if the user point to a different object, we can read that information a lot. It's sort of like how screen readers work with images uh, uh, when people read out, you know, uh, alternative text. Book. Pillow. Candle. And uh, of course, we have some other tools. For example, if you can uh, label some of the objects as important objects, we can also add contours or highlight on top of that object. So that's another example how we can better leverage the input from the developers. Uh, and to enable developers to better provide these information to us, we developed a, a Unity Developer Toolkit where we incorporated all these 14 uh, low vision tools uh, into this toolkit. And also uh, we um, build a plugin into the, unit, uh, into the Unity uh, uh, editor because so here Unity is actually a, a very widely commonly used uh, development platform for virtual reality. Uh, you can, uh, for example, drag different 3D objects into the environment. And you can also have, for each of the virtual elements, you have this inspect, uh, inspector tab that you can edit the different properties of the virtual objects. For example, the rotation, the position, the skill, and so on. And what we did with our toolkit is we did also add a plugin into the Unity platform so that we add uh, three more uh, accessibility uh, attributes to this inspector uh, field. Uh, so that the developer can better use the, this field to provide more uh, meta information for our accessibility tools in CNVR. So here is the example of the accessibility tab that we added to uh, the inspector uh, tab in uh, Unity. 
Uh, one example is the description. So for each of the virtual objects, the Unity developer can add a description for that object. And later, if they add this object description tool to their VR application, and the user can just point to different objects and hear the description very easily. So in general, we have a set of low vision tools that we designed for people with low vision to enable them to better perceive different virtual scenes. And also, and most of them are incorporated into a post hoc plugin. But at the same time, we provide a Unity developer toolkit so that we can enable developers to incorporate all these tools into their uh, application during the development process and also provide us, you know, more uh, metadata for us to better understand the scene and augment the scene uh, uh, in, a, in a more semantic way. So, which means our technology have two group users, uh, two group of users. One is low vision users uh, who are going to use the different tools, and another group is uh, the Unity developers, who's uh, you know our potential uh, pot potential uh, target users who can use our Unity developer toolkit. That's why we conducted two sets of studies to understand the effectiveness of both the low vision tools and also the toolkit. So we start with uh, recruiting uh, 11 low vision participants and ask them to use our tools to conduct the three different virtual tasks. Uh, these are uh, all very representative tasks in uh, virtual reality, including uh, manual navigation, virtual uh, uh, visual search, and also target shooting tasks. And we ask the participants to select their preferred tools and complete the task. And of course, we have a baseline, which is their best correction, which means the user can wear their eyeglasses or uh, if they don't. Uh, uh, so the best correction just means the user can uh, wear their glasses to correct their vision a little bit. Um, so here is the result. And we find that seeing VR can significantly reduce uh, the participant time when they complete try to complete the different tasks, which uh, means uh, our technology is very effective in terms of uh, enhancing their performance in uh, the virtual reality scenes. And also, um, not only in our study, actually, uh, just occasionally, uh, Quite accidentally, I I was you know looking through YouTube and I find uh, there is this uh, YouTuber who did a review on all the CNVR applications and this uh, uh, this person actually ha uh, has visual impairment uh, uh, himself and he make a very thorough review uh, on our technology um, and here is part of his comment. Honestly, this toolkit and. All of the things that they've already implemented solves the vast majority of all my complaints and concerns and frustrations that I've had trying to use virtual reality interfaces. You know, the, the, the text and in, in interface items being a set distance from your face and you can't get closer uh, because it keeps moving away. Um, things being far away, things blending in, um, you know, contrast, uh, just any number of things. I mean, this addresses so many issues. I love, again, the, the idea of the magnifier, the high contrast, the text to speech, some of the outlines and colors things. Um, this is kind of the, the breakthrough that I've been hoping for, that I've been dreaming for, that I've been dreaming about. Uh, well, so the reason I play this is uh, first, uh, I want to show the technology is effective, but also on the other hand, you can tell that uh, there are a lot of people out there who try to use the mainstream virtual reality technologies, uh, even though they have visual impairments. That's why it is very important to design technologies to make this emerging platform uh, more accessible to them. And also, on the other hand, we uh, try to evaluate uh, the our Unity toolkit with developers. Uh, and we recruited six Unity developers and asked them to use our toolkit uh, and incorporate the uh, our tools into their development process and ask about their experience. And all of them uh, find that our tools are very easy to use, very easy to incorporate uh, into their uh, ongoing projects. And uh, the more interesting thing is they actually emphasize the importance of come up with this type of solutions to uh, make virtual reality more accessible. So as one of the developer mentioned, we sometimes got asked by the accessibility team at our company, you need to be accessible, but they don't really understand what accessibility is in the 
VR context, you are the first that actually look this deeply into this problem. And also to make a bigger com uh, uh, impact, we actually also open source the, the CNVR Unity toolkit. And if you're interested in, you can feel free to follow this link and try it out. So that's all uh, the, uh, the projects that I want to talk about today. And to summarize, uh, I talk about the first uh, uh, technology that we designed, which is a haptic controller that enable people with uh, visual impairments to freely explore and navigate a virtual space. And in this case, we focused more on cane users and people with very limited vision. And the second one is seeing VR, where we design and build a set of tools, but more focused on people with low vision and leverage their functional vision to augment the different virtual environment for them. Uh, and uh, I also have uh, some other different projects in terms of augmented and virtual reality. So if you're interested in, please feel free to go to my uh, homepage and take a look. Thank you so much, and I'm open to questions. Yeah, we um, had hi. a couple of questions in the, sorry, go on. I'm sorry, uh, this is Yao. Uh, I should be in the queue uh, if you have a, a queue for questions, sorry. Uh, you, you can go ahead and ask. We can also get to the chat later. Okay, yeah. Uh, all right, hi, uh, this is Yao. I'm an accessibility researcher at Meta. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Professor Zhao for this talk is very eye-opening. Um, I have a question about uh, the cane troller because um, I'm thinking about a kind of completely virtual alternative and I would love to hear your thoughts. Um, by, you know, completely virtual, I mean, you know, there's no extra hardware, you know, needed beyond the Oculus controllers. Uh, it's, it's like a, a white cane uh, projected in VR, you know, like a saber in, in the game, you know, Beat Saber, and that's capable of interacting with, uh, with the virtual objects. Uh, and I would like to hear, uh, like, how it compares to uh, the controller, uh, what are the um, limitations, and what, what are the potential kind of, uh, benefits to uh, blind users? Yeah, thanks a lot for the question. Actually, um, if when you mentioned this, actually I remember when we tried to develop the, this technology, right? The, I think there was a online post that someone, I don't think that was uh, officially published, but someone tried to use the, the controller, right? And with the virtual cane, and uh, uh, if it uh, touch any virtual objects, there is, it's, there is no external devices. So that, but you know, whatever you can, the feedback wise is very limited because I think what they can do is they can generate the vibration uh, and also some uh, spatial audio uh, to let people know, okay, my virtual can did hit a virtual object. But uh, uh, when we look at that, actually we felt that um, it's, yes, that's some sort of uh, feedback, but it's not really enough to, you know, give people a comprehensive enough experience in terms of how they can perceive the object, right? For example, how big an object is and, you know, what type of texture uh, texture we can give. And uh, here I want to emphasize that, you know, haptic experience is kind of important, not only limited to vibration, right? And the unique part here of King Troller is we try to generate this force feedback. Uh, this physical resistance to really stop people when you hit on different uh, objects. So I think that's uh, you know a big add-on in terms of the uh, not using uh, exter uh, you know external devices because if we only have the current off-the-shelf uh, controller, then it could be very difficult to uh, generate this type of uh, haptic feedback. It's probably very limited to. Um, vibration but i also agree with you you know uh in terms of the cost right and uh availability is important to you know sort of limit ourselves to think about if we only have this off the shelf controller right and how we can generate a better uh experience uh, i think that's also a very interesting direction to look into let's say if we only limit it to vibration then how can we design the vibration patterns to give people different experience to simulate different textures even simulate you know the different experience when 
I hate on different, you know, yeah. objects made up with, uh, made with different materials. Yeah, that could be uh, interesting as well. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, since we're sort of running out of time, I was wondering if we can just wrap up and conclude. And then for people that had more questions, they can stay further and chat if you have some um, extra minutes, you, you Hong. But uh, just wanted to say thank you and give a shout out to Jesse Anderson, who, is, um, who had a lot of work that was highlighted by you Hong, but also in the, in the chats with the YouTube link. And um, I was going to share my screen, but we can also just continue on here and continue the question session. Um, next month, we have another talk coming up. So for those interested, we will please follow uh, XR. Actually, I'll just share a screen. Mm. Yeah, so we have these different XR access uh, talks every month. So please follow us either on Slack at uh, bit.ly slash XR access hyphen Slack. And then the research network channel on there will get updated on all the different research talks that come up. And you can also follow on Twitter or um, contact us uh, through email. The Twitter uh, call out is at XR access and then the Email is info at xrassess.org. Um, they will, these links will be in the chat. But other than that, again, wanted to give a shout out to Jesse Anderson for the YouTube tutorials and also the great feedback for some of the work that Yu Hong highlighted. And we can continue this um, Q and A for sure. I didn't want to go away from it, but I just wanted to be respectful of the of the time. I know someone had their hand up initially, but. There were also a lot of questions I noticed in the chat around like sort of bringing these tools to like market and asking about the feasibility of cane troller possibly coming um, or, or the adoption of cane troller for the general public or seeing like when can the seeing VR toolkit come into market if you wanted to address those questions you want. Uh, yeah, I saw one question. Sorry, I didn't see the, the chat, uh, the question in the chat. Uh, so I see the question about how uh, uh, my perspective in terms of uh, bringing controller uh, into the market. Uh, so I think at this stage is more of a prototype, but I do know that Microsoft has uh, uh, some uh, more improved uh, uh, version of it that uh, add, you know, the 3D dimensional uh, force feedback to it. I believe add also uh, has uh, post a link to that. So please feel free to read it. Uh, and in terms of um, bring them to market, I think it's a long-term shot in terms of because the technology, I think uh, there could still be, you know, distance between, you know, a prototype versus a very robust uh, uh, product product that people can actually use, right? Uh, so I think there is still a long way to go, but uh, I'd love to see, you know, uh, uh, developers uh, in the big company, tech companies to continue uh, develop it and make it something uh, into something that is uh, very handy for people to use and purchase. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, Haley, you have your hand. Hi, yeah, so I, I love your research. Hi. Um, so my question is, it's a bit of a logistic question. Um, so there's a lot of heterogeneity in low vision conditions, right? Um, in which you kind of, you can tell um, because you're at your toolkit, you're, you're providing a lot of different tools um, to kind of compensate for that. Um, so the logistic part is given all of this heterogeneity, like it, in theory, it's good to recruit as many people as possible, right? Uh, so how do you personally, like in your lab, or do you have any recommendations for whenever you are studying um, toolkits and similar research questions with people with low vision? How, how do you do it? <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, 
so are you asking that there are just so many different types of low visions and how do we uh, address their needs and how do we design technologies maybe to cover all of their needs or do we want to focus on a specific type of low vision? A little bit uh, of both. Like how do you recruit mm -hmm. people in general? And then like if you're focusing on particular problems, how do you go about isolating those problems when there's already a small sample? So getting a subset is, it's a bit of a messy question, but... No, no, that's a great question, right? And I think it's also the logistic wise, it could be something that is very challenging. Uh, so uh, in general, most of my research, I recruit people with low vision broadly because we do want to see uh, people with different types of low vision conditions, what their experience. And we want, in terms of our technology design, we try to consider these different perspectives. But there are also some uh, patterns we can observe gradually along our research. For example, what type of people with low vision would prefer what type of augmentations. For example, people with central vision loss, and then we may want to give them some, uh, uh, well, people with peripheral vision loss, we may want to give them uh, some guidance uh, in terms of, you know, really magnify things because they usually have very good visual acuity, right? Uh, but uh, it's hard for them to find things. So maybe we give them some specific guidance. But for people with central vision loss, their vision can be very, very blurry. And then we may want to, you know, add high contrast and we may want to uh, magnify things. So we do observe all of these different patterns. Uh, and in terms of um, participants, uh, some of our, my current research, we do want to uh, focus on more detailed uh, uh, low vision conditions. For example, recently we have a research uh, that we try to understand the gaze pattern of people with central vision loss, because we believe that's one of the most challenging type uh, for them to leverage eye tracker. Right? Because, for example, people with peripheral vision loss, they have very good visual acuity, then maybe eye tracking is not that difficult for them. But with central vision loss, it is difficult. So sometimes we do want to focus on a specific type of low vision condition and address the specific challenges they may encounter. Yeah, I'm not sure whether that's the answer to your question. <laughs> oh, that's great. And then kind of like last sub part is, um how do you go about recruiting them even? Yeah, so um, I'm actually trying to do that really uh, um, like aggressively now because I'm starting a new lab uh, at uh, Wisconsin Madison. So what we usually do is we reach out to the local uh, disability organizations uh, in on campus and outside of the campus. And I'm also, uh, building our uh, collaborations with the low vision clinics uh, at our university as well. So that's another way we do recruitment. Thank you. <laughs> Dylan, you have your hand up as well? Yeah, so Yuhang, um, I first have to say, big fan of, uh, of, of this and of your work lately. I've been using the, the um, AR for stair navigation as a, as a big informant for my own research. Um, but I wanted to, to dive in quickly to um, uh, a clip you showed where you showed uh, some, some games like um, Space Pirate, uh, Trainer, mm -hmm. and some of the other ones using the, the low vision, uh, the seeing VR tools. Um, now, I guess my understanding of seeing VR was that it was basically the, the main kind of deliverable of it was a, a Unity, that Unity plugin, right? The developers mm -hmm. could take and try to integrate into their, uh, into their work. Um, is it possible for people to just kind of download it and use it on their own as low vision users? Because I, if that, so that would be really huge. Um, is there, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, uh, I may not make it very clear in my talk. So there are actually two outcomes from the set of tools. One is just as you mentioned, it's a postdoc plugin that any users can download directly and just run it, uh, give a path uh, to the application they have on their computer and all the applications will, uh, all these tools can be applied to that application. So the uh, example we show, uh, for example, Space Pirate is uh, the postdoc plugin. It's, there is uh, nothing, uh, has nothing to do with the developers. It's just that the end users can run the plugin and it's added to the existing uh, VR applications. And the reason we want to have the Unity uh, toolkit is sometimes we need some input from the developers. That's why we have another set of toolkit for developers. Right, is that something that 
the users would put in their Steam, or how did how do they actually get access to it? Because I I've been referencing the Steam, Steam you know seeing VR for years, and I never realized that that was something you could do without any developer kind of buying at all. Yeah, so that's a good question because this is more of a research, and we did build the plugin by ourselves, and we just it's like a exe file, and we run it and it, it apply to apply to uh, the virtual reality application. But I don't think we ever open source this piece of our work, so we only open source the, the developer toolkit. That's why you don't see it on Steam. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, because I I know. Um... If if you ever want to to collaborate with XR Access on making either of those, you know, putting pushing those out to further availability, I, I think that's definitely something we'd have a lot of interest in because I, I hear so many so many you know complaints of like I really love this, but it's in a Unity version that's like two years old, and yeah. it's it just things get out of date so fast. Um, oh yeah, we had that time. Uh, I remember while I tried to build this plugin, I have to look into the exact unit version of that application so that we can add things on top of it. So there are a lot of manual adjustments that, that I did just to modify that VR application. I believe that's also a reason that we didn't really release that because we need a lot of just the manual uh, tune of the specific uh, plugin to each of the applications. So it's not that, you know, as generic as the developer toolkit. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I think if, if at some point we can get a project on making this like easier to, to use, easier to update, um, or even work with Meta or Microsoft and code to like build it into the, the platform level settings, that would be like a huge win. Huge, so so yes. let's, let's connect on that afterwards if it's something you're interested in. But I want to give, there's a lot of other questions in chat. So I want to give, give them some time too. Yeah. Thanks, Dylan. I love to do that. Let's keep in touch on that. Yeah. Um, Mika, what's the, the next question in chat we want to queue up here? Jesse had a question earlier on, but he's they're trying to raise their hand, uh, but you can just speak. <laughs> oh, okay. Hello. Uh, hopefully my microphone is unmuted. Yeah, yep. I can hear you. Yeah. Um, thanks. Yeah. Thank you for this uh, session today. It was actually really interesting. And yes, I am the uh, person who was doing that review of that uh, seeing VR. Uh, oh, wow, thank you cool. for that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I've been talking about this like ever since I learned about it, I saw that seven minute video and like literally the, after I saw the video, I went and like, I'm going to do a commentary on this because I have thoughts. And so I just posted it right away, but kind of building on what Dylan was saying. Um, I know a lot of people, <clears throat> you know, my channel really focuses on blind, low vision, gaming, tech, VR, XR, and you know, myself alone, like super interested in, yeah, being able to, let's say the way you run a screen reader before you run any program on your computer, but like being able to just run an executable, whether it's through Steam or you download it from a website, I didn't know that there really was an executable that you could run and it would hopefully just sort of work. Um, but I would love to see uh, you know, a lot of the features, like you said, that are in that application, um, especially for me specifically, like the dashboard interfaces in dashboard headset interfaces are very hard because they a lot of times maintain a rather fixed distance. If they say it wants to be three feet away, then it's set three feet away. If you get closer, it kind of moves away from you. So being able to have that laser pointer text to speech or magnifier or anything, um, yeah, I would love to see this um, progress, whether it's open source or someone takes it over or whatever, but I would lo absolutely love to see this built into, let's say the Quest and Rift dashboards, or even just be able to have a, you know, well-advertised, hey, go download this executable file. And even though it's not perfect, you can use, um, you know, run this file like you would a screen reader and then launch Space Pirate Trainer or any number of Unity titles and just have it work, you know, maybe with uh, just like a consumer-facing 
version of it, even as is, would be pretty great. Yeah, that sounds great. Thanks a lot, Jesse. I, it's, it's so nice to actually meet you in person. I'll be citing, you know, coaching your video for such a long time. I oh, that's so funny. You. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't realize, yeah, I didn't realize it was you that was like presenting today. I'm like, oh, yes, yeah, sweet. I have so many questions. It's so great to be able to talk to you. So, yeah. And if anyone from Meta would like to chat about, uh, you know, making their dashboards and stuff accessible, please reach out. Yeah, sounds great. And we actually have some other uh, ongoing research about how to make uh, uh, social VR more accessible. And I'm sure my yes, students please. would love to hear your feedback. Can we uh, reach out so that uh, you can give us some feedback? Absolutely. Be I would be, yeah, I'd be glad to help out however I can uh, chat or, you know, speak or whatever you want me to do. Test, whatever. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'll be in yeah. touch. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Serena, you've had an interesting question about extending sort of our discussion of VR to AR. Did you want to unmute and talk about or expand on your question a little bit? Um, sure. Um, so yeah, I, I I think this is a great tool to help with the low vision users. Um, I'm just wondering because if the implementation could be in AR, I feel maybe they can use better this tool in their daily life instead of they have to log into a VR setting to use it. So I'm just wondering your thoughts or have you tried to make it into AR instead of VR? Yeah, thanks for the question. Actually, most of these tools, they are adapted from uh, AR. So that goes back to my PhD dissertation. So most of my PhD research focuses on design uh, augmented reality technologies for people with low vision and use them to augment the virtual world in different tasks, uh, the real world in different tasks. Uh, for example, how can we enable people to read? How can we enable them to find different products in a grocery store setting? And how can we enable them to walk on stairs in, in different navigation tasks? And most of these augmentations were adapted from my uh, like uh, work uh, designed for augmented reality glasses. I see, thanks. Yeah, there was a comment there about maybe like over relying on some of this tech if like AR starts to be more integrated into our lives, but I don't think we're super there yet. Um, but that was an interesting comment for sure. As, yeah. as like the things going on with like metaverse these days, it was a little bit strange. Um, I think that were all the major questions that we had, if, is there another? Mm, is it Kevin just to asked a question. Mm -hmm. is it yeah, I just read this a lot. Uh, is it possible to, oh, you can read a lot, sorry. <laughs> oh okay. no, uh, yeah, is it possible to download the different forms of visual impairment for Unity VR for simulation for sighted users, such as cataract, uh, macular degeneration, diabetic, Retinopathy and glaucoma. Mm. Oh, interesting. Um, I think there has been some research to simulate different low vision conditions in virtual reality. And there are some uh, smartphone applications as well. Uh, my, I myself, I haven't done the type of work, but uh, I do know there are even existing applications that can support that. I'm not sure whether there are, you know, uh, product level of applications uh, in Unity or uh, VR, but I, I've tried to use some of them on my smartphone <laughs> when I try to better understand how people perceive the world, yeah. And Kevin, I'll, I'll say, I, I think um, Thomas Logan, who runs our, our accessible development of XR, uh, was showing a low vision VR simulator in, in one of the meetings. So uh, if you ping him on our ADXR channel in Slack, um, you might be able to, to, to give you more info there.
Yeah, Dylan, you had a question that you posted earlier in the chat, but you were asking, are there theories on which kinds of haptic devices would be most useful for augmenting low vision VR experiences? Uh, are there uh, theories on which kinds of haptic devices would be most useful for augmenting low vision uh, VR experiences? Hmm. And, um, and just just to elaborate on that, you know, I, I've seen various types of haptic devices in terms of like vests that people can wear or belts or like collars that have like directional things on them or like hand based devices. I'm, I'm curious if you had an, an, a feeling on which of those would be the most useful. Yeah, I've actually seen some uh, some research uh, because I didn't do that much of haptic research uh, for now, but I read uh, came across some of them. Uh, people try to add, uh, especially explore, not really for people with visual impairments. I would say even for uh, sighted people, people explore uh, what type of ha haptic feedback and on which part of their body would be more sensitive and for people to better uh, understand the different information. Um, but I, I sort of feel that the conclusion is here and there because recently um, I'm more interested in the haptic feedback uh, on uh, people's facial area because that's where the head mounted display was. Uh, and then I've seen some research people said that the forehead uh, is more um, sensitive in terms of sensing the directions uh, as opposed to like uh, the other uh, area, especially the uh, more hairy area. Uh, so that's one conclusion I remembered, but uh, I do know uh, there are a lot of devices also like uh, handwear or bodywear devices, but uh, I'm not very sure about what conclusion they really have, especially focus on people who are blind. Uh, thank you so much for answering all these questions, Yuhong. Um, if people had more questions, is there a way that they can reach out to you or any of your students in your lab or just uh, regarding some VR, AR accessibility things? Oh, I'm just asking, um, is there a way that people can reach out to you for more questions? Yeah, so uh, you can uh, reach out to me via my um uh, email address, uh, yuhang.zao at uh, cs.wisc.edu. I should have put this on my slide, actually, but let me uh, type it in uh, in the chat. So, oops. Uh, so that's my email address. Uh, and it's also on the homepage that, uh, the my homepage, which is, uh, I, that I put on my slides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for giving the talk today. This was a really great discussion as well. Please reach out to Yu Hong on the email if there's questions and we shall stop recording and wrap up here. Thank you so much. I yeah, thank you. Talk.